please help me welcome to the stage, George Durrani. Two months ago, I got an urgent phone call from a really good friend of mine who told me that her husband, my other good friend, had just suffered a serious heart attack. And then a couple of weeks after that, I got another phone call from another friend of mine who said that he had just been diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. And after both of those phone calls, I had two immediate thoughts. The first thought was, wow, I hope these men are okay. And thankfully, for now, they both are. But my second thought was this. Have I said everything that I need to say to both of those men about how important they have been in my life and about what a difference they have made for me and for my family? Everything? Or, if they die, will I have regret about what I have left unsaid to both of them? Since 1998, I have worked with over 4,000 cancer victims and their families. And for the last 25 years, I have worked with thousands of men and women who have been in psychiatric hospitals and rehabilitation facilities, or who have attended one or more of the weekend retreats and programs that I've been a part of and have facilitated. And one of the things that often comes up during those events is something that has to do with regret. And by that I mean this, I wish before so-and-so had died, I had told him how much I loved him or I had told her how important she was to me, or I had told them what a difference they had made in the world. You and I know what that kind of regret is. It sits here kind of in the pits of our stomachs, and if left untended, can fester there for months or years or maybe even a lifetime. Tonight, I want to address that specific kind of regret, which I call end-of-life regret. And as you think about it, there might be some of that occurring for you right now. It might be about a grandparent, or a parent, or a spouse, or a close friend, or a sibling, or maybe even a child. Look, you and I don't know the date and the time and the circumstances of our own deaths. We can look at actuarial tables and life expectancy tables and get some general idea of that, but the specific day for us is a mystery. And once our ticket is punched, in the words of Arnold Bennett, the English author and poet, we shall never have any more time. Never. I went to my first funeral when I was four years old. It's estimated in this country that by the age of, of 20, the average person will go to at least two funerals or celebrations of life of someone very close to them. By the age of 40, that number is 10. And if you're lucky enough to live to be 90, that number is 50 of close family friends, close family or friends. The numbers are staggering. And that doesn't even include all the people whose funerals you've attended that you barely know. Remember the last time that you went to a funeral or celebration of life or memorial service? We've all been there. They're beautiful and they're moving and they're important and we should continue to do them. But have you noticed that in our culture, most of us celebrate the lives of the important people in our life after they have died? after they have died. The person central to that event isn't in the room anymore. We have designed a program for them and we speak about them in the past tense. They're like the stars of a show and they're not in it. I say we should change that. Not by bringing somebody back from the dead, although that really would be a cool trick. <laughs> but by celebrating the lives of those people before they die long before they die, so that none of us has to experience that end-of-life regret. My mother died in March of 2015. About two years before she died, I had this very simple conversation with her. It went exactly like this. I said to her, 
Mom, thank you for giving me my life. That was it. That was all of it. Those seven words, and only seven words, changed me. And I think they changed her. A week before she was supposed to be released, well, she had just completed open heart surgery, and this was a week after that, I went to see her in the hospital. Just me and her. Now remember, she and I didn't have a particularly close relationship. It was cordial, but not close. But when I went to see her, I was there for about 30 minutes. After we were done, I was walking out of the room and she called me back in. And she said, son, and I turned around and she said, son, I love you. That was it. Those were the last words that I heard from my mom. She died unexpectedly the next morning. Here's the thing that happened for me though. I noticed something new. Even though I was sad, and I'm still sad, I didn't have any regret. None. I had none of that end of life regret. I was able to grieve and accept her death without regret. So why is it that we wait for someone to die before we celebrate their lives? Is it because it's easier for us to speak to someone and about someone in the past tense than it is to speak to them directly and tell them what incredible human beings they are? Is it because maybe it's just too beautifully heartbreaking to be that vulnerable with somebody else? Or maybe it's because we're confronted with the realities of our own death when we have conversations like that. Two years ago, I created a, a ceremony to celebrate the lives of people in our life before they die. Imagine being in a room or a space with 30 of your closest family members and friends who are gathered there to celebrate and to honor you. And you're sitting in your king's chair or your queen's chair, and each person comes up to you one at a time and says to you directly, I love you. You matter to me. You made a difference in my life. Here's what you meant to my family. Can you imagine if you were that recipient, how that feels for you and how it's landing? And then imagine if you're the one doing the speaking, how that would be for you on the other side of that. And then imagine what it does for the room, for the space. And imagine what it could do for the world. See, I don't have to imagine it because I've seen it many times. Dell was 91 years old. Doesn't she look great, by the way? She was still in a clear frame of mind and healthy. And we gathered her family and her friends for an event like that. And you have to understand this about Dell. She was a giant in the Tucson community. She was a community leader. She was committed to social justice. She had spent her whole life making a difference for other people. And after we did the ceremony and she got a chance to say thank you to everyone, we walked out together to, the, to her car. And on the way out there, I said to her, Dell, how was that for you? And she grabbed my arm and she said, George, I had no idea, really, no idea how important my life was to all these people and what a difference I had made in the world and how important my work was. Thank you. Dell died less than six months later. So I ask you now, who do you know in your own life who you could honor and celebrate and acknowledge in that way. How old are they? How healthy are they? How much time do you have with them? How much time do they have with you? And what's the worst thing that could happen if you have a conversation like that with them? And what's the worst thing that could happen if you don't? So what is it exactly that we're waiting for? Do you want to have that end of life regret thing or not? 
One of the best examples of not waiting comes out of a story that my friend Roy told me about his three-year-old son, Eric. Eric and Roy were walking together holding hands, and little Eric grabbed his dad's hand and said, Daddy, thank you for helping me with my life. And Roy looked down and said, did I just hear you right, Eric? Did you just tell me thank you for helping you with your life? And Eric said, yes, Daddy. That's what I said. So there you have it. From the mouth of a three-year-old who understands something that most of us grown-ups have probably forgotten, that there simply isn't any reason to wait. We don't have to wait for anyone or for everyone who matters to us. So don't wait. Don't wait one more day or one more minute. And I'm going to borrow little Eric's words and not wait either. Thank you for being here. And thank you all for helping me with my life.